fellow photographer, how's it going? I'm Michael Zedel. This is the fourth and the last video in our little series about shooting spicy holiday photos of your partner and your friends. This is a little bit sad because tomorrow my wife Emily and I, we have to leave our favorite, favorite holiday resort, which is Club Spice here on Lanzarote. However, today we still got some time and we want to share six more tips that you can use with pretty much any camera when you are on holiday. So let's dive right into those tips. The first tip I want to give you today is about angles and points of view. They are so important in photography, but still I see a lot of photographers just standing at one point, not varying a bit on their end, but still they expect their photos to show big variety. And it's so easy. I want you to adapt two habits. First one is the dirt to the cloud habit. The second one is a 180 habit. First one, dirt to the cloud. What do I mean? Make it a habit to vary your point of view from the very low to the very high. Typically, you can at least vary like two meters. Now you can always go low and usually you can go high just by holding the camera up or climbing a couple of stairs or using a step stool or something. What you will see then is that a very low point of view, belly button and lower, will typically make the legs of your subjects longer. Women usually like long legs. On the other hand, if you go up, it makes the shoulders wider. Men typically like wide shoulders. This is because whatever is closest to your lens will expand. The shorter the focal length, the stronger it will expand. If you're shooting with 50 millimeters, then you already start seeing this effect. And if you're shooting with 35, then it's really obvious. The second habit I would like you to adopt is the 180, because typically you can go around your subject at least 180 degrees and find out, are there any other angles that you want your subject to photograph from? Sometimes you want your light to follow, then just take around your light stand. Just don't vary the distance to the subject and then your settings don't need to change. Sometimes you don't want the light to follow, you just want to find out new lighting patterns. But make it a habit to go around your subject and explore what's happening when you go around. So these two rules, dirt to the clouds and the 180, they will give you a lot of variation and you will always find the one or the other angle that is very interesting and that you probably haven't thought of yet. Tip number two. This is about composition. I would like to make you a follower of the rule of thirds. In one of our videos we said that we should fill the frame with our model, with our subject. In another video we said we should make use of a layered composition where the subject is in the middle ground. but where exactly should we position our model? And the most practical and the most universal tip that I can give you for that is the rule of thirds. The rule of thirds is a close cousin to the golden rule, if that might ring a bell for you, but it's, it's very simple and very practical. It's a rule of thumb, it's a guideline which applies to the process of composing a visual image. It's very easy. Pretty much all cameras allow you to project a grid with two vertical and two horizontal lines into the LCD display or with the new mirrorless cameras even in the electronic viewfinder which is even better. Switch on this grid at all times. Now take the key element of your photo which is usually the face of your model maybe even the particular eye that is closest to your lens if you have a close-up portrait and position this key element at a point where two of these lines cross. Position it exactly at the intersection of two of these lines. Then there are some key lines in your frame which might be where her arm or her leg is um, going through the frame or her body line or the horizon or something similar. Position these key lines along one of the lines of the grid, if possible. Yeah, you don't have to follow this religiously, you don't have to bend your model for it, but this rule gives you a really, really good starting point, which is a starting point like it's a typically ideal composition. So I suggest try to follow it. Tip number three, lighting from the short side. What does that mean? We were talking about lighting your subject, lighting broadly into her face to even out everything. We were also talking about 
the 180 habits that you go around your model and try to find other interesting angles. When you do both of that, then pretty soon you will discover another interesting lighting pattern, which is the shooting into the light basically. And that means the light is hitting the side of her face, which is further away from the camera. So the side of your face that is close, that your camera catches is in shadow. Uh, the other side is light, the camera side is in shadow. So what does that do? It's point A, a very strong, interesting lighting pattern. And point B, it's slimming down her face. Remember how we slimmed down her body by tilting it forward and bringing the hips a bit back. Now we are also slimming down her face by lighting it from the short side, by shooting into the light. Play around with it, try it out. I think in a lot of situations, it's very interesting. Tip number four. If you want to take spectacular photos outdoor, then most probably the sky is an important element to the photo. Maybe water is another important element. And if you can improve the rendition of sky or water right in camera, then you should do it. Sometimes it's really mandatory. For example, over here, I've got this beautiful black stone backdrop and then the really bright sky. All in all, this is a difference between really bright and really dark tones and it's much more than the camera can handle. The dynamic range wouldn't be good enough. So why not use a filter which darkens down particularly the sky, making the dynamic range to handle a little bit smaller and then the camera can handle it. And all of that is done with a polarizer filter, which I attach in front of my lens. As such a polarizer filter, it filters away some light, especially the light which comes from the sun in a 90 degree angle. Now you attach it to the lens and then in case of a circular polarizer like this one, I turn the front until I see that the effect of the filter is really good, until it really darkens the sky so that the camera can handle the dynamic range. So using such a polarizer, skies are much more dramatic, skies are a bit darker, and it also gives your flash some wiggle room to brighten up the subjects in the foreground. If you have got sunglasses, which have a polarizer effect, like a lot of them do, you can try out polarizing by just holding it in front of your small lens, like from a smartphone, turning it a bit, and then you see the effect of such a filter. And it doubles as a poor man's polarizer in case you don't have one with you. Tip number five, tethering your camera. I don't want all my photos to be only on my camera. I want the photos to be on my laptop and my tablet. So what do I do? I tether the camera to my laptop or to my tablet. How can I do that with all kinds of different cameras? Well, with my big boy DSLR, what I have is I put this little Wi-Fi card. It's an iFi Mobi 32 gigabyte card I put this into the, C, uh, into the SD card slot of my big camera. Then the camera stores the JPEGs on the iFi card and the RAW files to a CF card, which is in the CF slot. The iFi card opens up a Wi-Fi hotspot. I log into the hotspot with my laptop and then the card transfers all the JPEGs onto my laptop. In my small camera, I only have one card slot for an SD card. So in this case, the iFi card stores the JPEGs and my RAWs, but it will transfer only the JPEGs to my tablet because the JPEGs can transfer very fast. The RAWs would take a long time, so I prefer to not do that. Lastly, when I shoot with my iPhone, I'm also kind of tethered because my phone is always locked into the internet in one way or another. And then I can use a cloud service to synchronize my photo files. But what I use most of the time is Adobe's Creative Cloud. Yeah, so I shoot directly into, um, into Lightroom Mobile. Lightroom Mobile then synchronizes its collections with my online account and also with the Lightroom installation on my MacBook. So this way, everything that I do in Lightroom Mobile on my phone is also reflected in Lightroom on my MacBook once I open it and once I go through the photos over there. That's quite handy. So these are my ways to have a backup wirelessly on another device. And um, of course, there are other ways. For example, my little mirrorless camera has got a built-in Wi-Fi. I could also use that. 
However, it's really not as handy as a little iFi mobile card, which just works beautifully. This brings us to tip number six, Adobe Lightroom. Let's talk about the one app that really makes my life so much easier as a photographer. Adobe Lightroom offers me a fast and convenient way to go through hundreds and thousands of photos, choose my couple of photos that I really want, get them edited, get them retouched, export them as JPEGs, as contact sheets, or post them on social media, or ship them into my portfolio. When I go through my photos in Lightroom, I use tools like the spray can to spray a star rating onto selected photos. I do editing, I do corrections like exposure corrections, sharpness, I tune the highlights, the shadows and things like that. Everything I do is synchronized between my computer and my online account and my mobile devices. So wherever I am, I can pick up the work. Regarding the capabilities of Lightroom, I can barely scratch the surface over here. It's about efficient ways of keywording photos, exporting them in different sizes, applying watermarks on the fly and all of that. But one aspect that I really want to bring home here is that it makes me fast in choosing the few photos that actually matter. At this point in time, Lightroom is available for Mac OS, for Windows and for iOS. I know on other operating systems there are alternatives. The Linux people, for example, they use Darktable instead of Lightroom. However, whatever you're using, check out if Lightroom is available for you. And if yes, then definitely make use of it. If I could only have one application as a photographer, then Lightroom would be it. Thank you so much for watching this video. It really means a lot to me. If you haven't seen the other free videos that we made over here, then jump back and have a look at them as well. They are jam packed with tips and tricks. Give us a thumbs up. Please click on like, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out our magazine at goodlightmac.com and watch out for our upcoming ebook. It will go much more into details of all these kinds of shoots and it will also tell the story about how Emily and I got into this open-minded photography scene and how it changed our life. Until then, I really wish you a lot of fun for your photo shoots and I wish you good light. Mm -hmm.